Welcome everybody to this special webinar uh, on, on, on youth ministry. Uh, we, we titled this webinar Post-COVID-19 Youth Ministry uh, in Rural, Urban, and Suburban Contexts. Uh, we're very excited to be uh, speaking on this topic today. We have a lot of uh, great panelists that will be joining us today. We have uh, Dean Borgman, we have Dr. Virginia Ward, uh, Brad um, Powell, um, and um, Chelsea Erickson. Uh, all representatives are either professors or, or, or alumni of Gordon-Conwell that will be speaking on this topic. I know many of you uh, are either working in youth ministry or have some type of connection to the speakers here. So we're really thankful for you guys to be on the call. And we hope uh, that this can be an informative session for you uh, to learn about how to respond in these times of crisis, as well as to learn a little bit about Gordon-Conwell as well, if this is your first time uh, hearing about us. Uh, so welcome once again, everybody. Um, as well, let me give a quick introduction to two other people here on the call uh, who work in the admissions office here at Gordon-Conwell. Uh, Katie Reitgart, uh, if you could give a quick uh, wave, and Kristen Chalapali as well, uh, give a quick wave as well. And my name is uh, Daniel Monson as I work uh, in the admissions office as well. So if you have any questions about Gordon-Conwell or the seminary or your applications, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and let us know. So. Let me go ahead and uh, begin this time by giving a quick overview of what the structure of this webinar will look like, just so you know what to expect. Uh, we'll spend the first uh, 40 or so minutes hearing from each of the panelists. Each of the panelists will speak for about 10 minutes on a particular topic in regards to youth ministry. Uh, one will be speaking from a rural, suburban, from a urban and a suburban context and a digital uh, context as well. Uh, and then after that, uh, for the last 20 minutes of the call, we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, so as you're listening, if you have any questions that come to mind, please feel free to jot them down and we'll have some time at the end for you guys to ask questions. So once again, thank you for being here uh, and let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Post-COVID-19 youth ministry in rural, urban, and suburban contexts. Uh, uh, Dean Borgman, uh, it's a huge uh, topic uh, that, that we're talking about. And I want to see if you could get us started uh, in beginning, beginning to understand some of the challenges and obstacles facing the church uh, in our modern context. You know, not only just post, just not only COVID-19, but a, a lot of the work that's happening right now uh, within just society and, 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 and civil rights that's happening right now. There's a lot going on right now. So I want to see if you could kick us off uh, to begin to explore this topic. Of what does youth ministry look like? Dean Borgman here, and uh, thank you all for joining. I uh, am into history. I've been a history teacher, professor, and I'm also into personal stories. So that's a little bit of where I'm coming from. And I think it's nice of you to listen to an old guy who started youth work in the 1940s in the rural Midwest uh, while I was a college student. And then in the 1950s, I was in the Army Airborne and worked for Youth for Christ down in the South. Then came up to Bridgeport, Connecticut, where I uh, was fortunate in working in a team of uh, a dynamic youth group that had 100, then 200, almost 300, and mixed racially uh, group of people, young people that went out after some lively music and a talk that I usually gave and uh, out for pizza, ice cream or, or whatever. And then the next nights after church, we had follow up and discipling going on to that. Still in the 1950s, I began teaching down in New Canaan, Connecticut, a very wealthy and liberal town and so forth and started New England Young Life there and uh, had experience there. <clears throat> Beautifully, God and graciously took me to the city of New York City. And I spent the 60s uh, a good bit on New York's Lower East Side and up in Harlem. And there my education as a young, white, and rather cocky young person, uh, really, uh, I, I was transformed. That was the greatest degree I ever had from the streets uh, of, of the city. And uh, it, it affected me very, very deeply. Uh, out of that experience, God very graciously brought me, after some personal losses and difficulties, up uh, to teach uh, a Young Life and Gordon Conwell program in the 1980s and 90s. And those were exciting days because the youth culture was blooming in the 80s and 90s. 
you had John Hughes's movies, if you remember The Breakfast Club and Sixteen Candles, Risky Business and other kinds of things like that. And the music was going wild, uh, moving out from a broad uh, popular basis to Motown and, uh, and rock and roll and uh, punk and, and, and uh, all, all kinds of music configurations that needed to be exegeted uh, in our minds as we looked at it. And so out of the 80s and 90s was grown uh, a center for youth studies, which we had for many years and, uh, and some books that went out on that topic, developing a theology of, of youth ministry. Uh, and then uh, during, the, uh, uh, during this century, sadly, pastors and, and youth, young people themselves, seminarians, oh began to lose interest in youth ministry and go in some different ways uh, to, the, to the point of, uh, of uh, cutting the programs at uh, the Hamilton campus, while uh, a few courses remain down at CUME, which uh, Dr. Virginia Ward will talk about. But the point that really impresses me now as we've watched Gen X move into the millennials and then into iGen or Gen Z with the alphas following, we're, we're watching uh, young people uh, move in a whole different direction with so much information with the click of their thumb and more than they need that they're learning to learn anything they want by themselves. But interestingly, they would still like to have some adults learning with them and so I feel that in youth ministry, the, the era of creating youth programs and then fo discipleship follow-up uh, is, is moving beyond to a whole new challenge. And that's a challenge of getting into the youth culture with young people and learning about their video games and what they're doing uh, along the lines of programming and of course all the kinds of communication they have with each other. And instead of leading them, learning with them, and learning creatively with them, and then allowing them to take leadership. And I think in these twin crises of the pandemic and the shooting of George Lloyd, which only follows, of course, a long list of brutality to Black Americans, uh, that we have an era today in which young people want to lead. After the Parkland, Florida, uh, shootings, young people took tremendous leadership uh, and, and it, it took place around the country. And now after the shooting of George Lloyd, we see young people joined with uh, older adults as well, and sometimes little children, uh, joining in this tremendous protest. And it, it leads us, I believe, to the challenge of the mission of Jesus Christ. I think you young people today must demand a new kind of youth ministry education. Seminaries for youth ministry, seminaries for youth ministry and our urban core land and our rural outer outposts. Uh, that will, you, you must demand that. Uh, you must be asking for that. Seminaries must see that there's a demand for a new kind of instruction and a new kind of leadership. Youth ministry needs a new mission. And that mission should follow the mission of Jesus Christ in Luke 4, to bring the good news to the poor and to release the underclasses and the underprivileged. And that's what young people are talking about and, and acting on in their protest today, which many of my white Christian adults don't want to even talk about these days. It's too volatile. It's too awkward. They don't want to talk about the revolution that's happening in our country. But in a very divided country, uh, where adults are stuck in their own ideologies, theologically and politically. We need young people that will span this gap and will bring us together in a whole new way. And I think you, as young people facing your future, must be asking for that kind of education. So uh, <clears throat> I look forward to your questions afterwards, and uh, I'll pass it on for now. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dean. Really appreciate you. Um, next, we will uh, go ahead and hear from Dr. Virginia Ward. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be with you. My assignment here with you today is to talk a bit about youth ministry post-COVID and what it looks like in the urban environment and how we can look at some of the needs and the challenges that are facing urban areas as well as multi-ethnic ministry. As you know, youth ministry uh, has, as Dean so eloquently talked about, the formation of it and how it's kind of grown over the years. And in the urban setting, we have pretty much followed the suburban example of youth ministry. We needed a full-time youth leader. We needed a space. We needed resources. And for some, that worked, but for most, it didn't. It negated the family element of urban societies. It negated the ethnic spaces that most of our cities dwell in. So if you've been tracking cities, you'll note that cities came from a space where as the, the rural areas began to send in young people into cities as far as being able to recruit, money, to get money for their families, that's where the jobs were, was in the city. People come into the cities even today for entertainment. That's where they come to because uh, it's life is found in the city. And so churches and ministries in the city, and but also our uh, economically poor and those who are in nowadays where in the past it was economically poor but nowadays today you have a wide range of people in the economic stream in the city so it's not just the poor so I want to challenge those of you that when you think urban you just see black or you just see Latino or you just see poor people our cities are some of the are becoming some of the wealthier spaces in the country that especially the city of Boston and for those of you that may be new to Gordon Conwell that you may be aware that we do have a campus in Hamilton we do have a campus in Boston right in the heart of of uh, Dudley Station in Boston and it is very diverse you could have someone there that's on government assistance and someone that's living in a condominium that they purchased for almost a million dollars. And so the spectrum is very wide. We have families who are single families, and meaning just a single individual, and you also have two parent homes. So I don't want you to, I want to dispel whatever mental models you might have of urban. I want you to see it as a geography, a, a geographical place, and also a place that is full of resources. We have not seen our urban areas as such and we need to. So youth ministry from an urban perspective, some of the needs and the challenges, I think it's the same coin, has to become more multi-ethnic. And it can't become multi-ethnic just from the standpoint of you, it looks that way, but it really has to move from an understanding and a knowledge of other ethnicities to an engagement. And if you just heard what Dean said, if you're watching the protests, you see that there's an engagement of multi-ethnicities. And the church has not done that well. And if we want to drill down further, the evangelical church has not done that well. And I believe this is a space where God is using our young people, but also using adults who are awake, who, who, who are paying attention to help be on the forefront to lead this. So the churches that I'm working with and some of the students that I'm working with at Gordon Conwell at the Boston campus, we have classes in youth ministry and one of our degrees going forward in the fall of 2021 will have an urban youth ministry concentration, which will help equip youth leaders to look at youth ministry on a holistic standpoint. Right now, one of the classes that I've inherited from Dean Borgman, Compassionate and Holistic Youth and Family Ministry, helps us to see that youth ministry is not all about just the spiritual. And we've done that. We brought in kids. We want to disciple them. We want to have relationships with them. We go where they go. But we've ignored their families. We've ignored their mental health. We've ignored some of the system, systemic issues that are real in the city and we have to as the church begin to address them because they're affecting our kids as socially they're affecting our kids mentally they're affecting our kids physically even as we look at some of the health issues that are affecting our youth and families youth ministry can no longer just be we're going to put these kids in a discipleship group babysit them for four years and then send them off to college we have to begin to equip and to train our youth leaders as well as youth themselves how to 
not just survive, but to thrive in urban environments. And yes, I see your comment, Shanice, here, uh, that yes, urban is not just synonymous with people of color and the poor. And so if nothing else today, I hope that that erases that mental model from your brain. And then also, to, I want to speak about the pace of the urban centers, that in the city, the pace is different. So in the city, youth ministries that are addressing youth from spectrums of higher risk kids, and by risk, I'm not just speaking of those that are uh, dealing with drugs and or alcohol, which is another thing that we put in mind when we think of risk, but some that are growing up in spaces, even some of our wealthier kids in the city are really dealing with challenges, dealing with identity identity, with purpose, and with belonging. And we have to equip youth leaders to be able to recognize that all across the spectrum and to be able to address it holistically, again, with the spirit at the forefront, but keeping in mind all of the other systems that surround that young person. And that's something that at Gordon Conwell we're being intentional about. We're also sharing information across ethnic lines. In my youth ministry class right now, I have students from from the Dominican Republican. I have students that are African. I have a student that, that are white. I have students that are from Caribbean islands. So we get to have a holistic and a well-rounded approach to ministry, not just for myself as a professor being a black woman, but also from the students who are in the classes. They're bringing how Haitian youth ministry takes place and how Korean youth ministry takes place and how Latino youth ministry takes place. And we bring that all to to the table. And we are able to see that actually there's more that unites us than divides us. That all kids are dealing with issues of their identity, but how that manifests in one ethnic space is different from how it, it manifests in another ethnic space. And I think that that's the beauty of the urban is that it's not just a melting pot, it's actually a stew. That each particular person gets to keep their identity and fully bring that to the table. So as we work with youth and we work with their families and we're working with the ministries that support them, they're also putting in place support systems that help those families. Now, some are ethnic specific and that's fine. I think there's space at the table for both. There are some that say we all need to come together and we all just need to be in one space. And I don't necessarily agree with that, especially where most of our multi-ethnic ministries are very whitewashed that other ethnic communities are unable to keep their identity and their identities are not celebrated at the table. Now, I believe that's where youth ministry is moving to, that we will see more ministries that are celebrating the ethnic spaces that each party brings and brings it together versus just saying you have to sing and clap on one and three or we have to all uh, play this way or we all have to go away into the mountains in order to celebrate youth ministry. I think there are ways that we can do that even in an urban context. There is beauty in the city. There is peace in the city. There is shalom in the city. And so one of the things that I would like to leave you with, as I've talked a little bit about the pace of the city being different, that in the city with the families and with the urban, especially post COVID, we have to all re-examine how we are functioning and how we are doing youth ministry. We're seeing a lot more family engagement where before some of us may have ignored parents, but now we cannot ignore parents. There's a different empowerment of families and a different empowerment of our youth Youth because there's spiritual development now, they have to own it. They can no longer rest in the comfort of coming to the church building or that dynamic youth leader who brings it all to the table. So uh, post COVID, we really, I think it's going to take some witty inventions from all of us. And it's a great opportunity for urban to learn from suburban, to learn from rural, and for all of us to put those things on the table and to figure out how do we garnish those resources. And then with those resources, how do we uh, best support and to enrich the families for which we come from. So I'm going to pause there and actually pass the baton back as well. And we'll get to more questions in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. So far, we've heard uh, from Dean Borgman speaking to us from uh, the ministry uh, post COVID-19 in the rural context. We've heard from Dr. Uh, Ward speaking from uh, youth ministry post COVID-19 from uh, an urban context. And now we're going to pass it on to uh, Brad Howell, 
Uh, Brad, if you could um, introduce yourself briefly uh, and let us know what does what ministry look like uh, post COVID-19 in digital spaces? Sure. Um, so I'm Brad Hall. I'm the, um, the Dean of Teaching and Learning at Gordon-Conwell. Um, I also teach. I'll be teaching a class on uh, ministry in a digital world this fall, which uh, is probably a timely class since we've all kind of landed in digital spaces and here we are in digital spaces having these kind of meetings. Um, I, I fell backwards into uh, digital uh, youth ministry as a research area and bridging the digital divide. Um, you know, I start. I was doing a practical theology degree in youth ministry, and the question became, what am I going to spend the next four to seven years of my life researching and pouring myself into? And I wanted it to be something interesting, right? If I'm going to do this, you know, I don't want it to be something I'm going to be totally bored with in uh, 12 months, because that's a long ways yet to go. And I, I kept going back and forth on topics, and my, my youngest kid at that time um, wanted to get on Facebook back in those days, and you weren't allowed to be on Facebook government said until you were 13 years old. And she says, that's a stupid rule. Why do we have that rule? And I said, you know, I don't know why we have that rule, but that's a good question. And I thought, you know, I'm going to research the, the digital divide and figure out what's going on here. And that opened up a quest um, that opened up a lot of doors for me in my academic career. I had no idea uh, that that would, that would do what it did. So uh, God is up to things in digital spaces, and we sometimes relegate God to anything but that space. And when we bring God into these spaces, we often feel very awkward, right? Uh, what does it mean to have a worship service in digital space? And what it has become to me in this spring is, well, we just do what we did live, and we'll just put it digital. Uh, and, and we're finding out that for a lot of people, that didn't work. And for young people especially, that hasn't worked. Uh, adolescents wouldn't sit there for 45 minutes and, and watch a worship service <laughs> and, and listen to the great, you know, as, as wonderful uh, words of wisdom that we have, we want to share with our adolescents. We just can never compete with the cat videos. We couldn't do it before COVID-19 and we're not doing it today. Um, we'd like to think we are, but we're not. There's this distraction culture. So I was kind of thinking about this. What, what are some of our obstacles to doing digital ministry, you know, well? And there's kind of three things that came to my mind. There's probably, oh, there is a lot more than this, but there's three that really just broad categories that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, the first is this whole concept of digital divide in the first place. Mark Prensky came up with a, this idea of the digital divide back in 2001. And when he was dreaming of how do we, or imagining how do we, frame what's going on with the young people today, those people were 20, 21 years old in 2001. The people he was thinking about are now pushing 40, they're entering their 40s. So when we think of digital divide and digital natives and digital immigrants, we're talking about people who are actually now 40 years old. And what does that mean? We continue to apply digital uh, natives on adolescents. Interesting, when that topic, or when those ideologies were created, Web 2.0 as we know it today didn't even exist yet. Well, what's Web 2.0? Well, the internet in the 70s, 80s, when no, no one of us could get on, was all about sharing information with our peers around the world, right? Academics, military, they wanted to have a way to share with their computers and have them talk to each other. In the 90s, that kind of opened up to a few more of us. I did early youth ministry. I did I didn't do early youth ministry like Dr. Borgman did, but um, my early youth ministry days in the 90s, we had AOL.com, right? And so you used to log in and you, you've got mail and you'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, and we could write these long emails to each other. We were so excited. We'd send this information back and forth. And, and youth ministry, we were cutting edge because I had my youth leaders creating Bible study in devotions and we had a mailing list in 1995 that we would send out to the youth group that was thoughts written up by your own peers about what God's saying in the word. And I would edit these with the students and, and we had these lists and the lists were so hard to keep up to date because everyone's AOL account kept getting changed. So they can get free points to keep using AOL. Many of us now have no idea what that even means. Right? It was a very information based world. We passed what we knew out to others. We shared, we connected at that level. When Friendster was invented in 2002, and then what was after Friendster? Uh, MySpace. 
Suddenly we could create ourselves in digital spaces. We could share from our hearts, our passions. We could tell the world, here's what I believe. Here's the music I like. Here's the, here's the posters that I would love having. And suddenly the digital spaces became like adolescents, teenage bedrooms, right? It used to be, you used to go to youth specialty conferences. They say, hey, if you get a chance, go get a visit over to your, your youth group, kids' houses, get a tour. And in the bedroom, you can see what the heart of that kid is like by looking at their bedroom. Well, they put it all out there for us in the early 2000s, in the last 10 years. This is my heart. This is what I share. This is what I want to believe. And we continue to use this idea of digital immigrant and digital natives. It ended up becoming a way of separating ourselves from adolescents. Oh, that's their space. That's their world. And if we came in it, we only came in to make sure that they knew to be invited to the next youth ministry event. And oh boy, it's going to be great. And I hope I get you know, a bunch of likes. Or we'd create silly videos that we'd hope go viral. Or we'd we would, we would gather people together and, and try to create our own version of, um, lost the word of it now, you know, those mass moments where everyone would just come together and it was supposed to go viral. And we had youth pastors trying to make that happen themselves. And it was kind of funny. So one of the things is digital divide. And we had, it was like, that's their world. That's not our world. But web 2.0, it became everybody's world. Suddenly, grandmas were going over their text limits, and people were like, well, that's what teenage girls were doing. But 65-year-old women were doing it, too, because the digital world became very relational after 2004. So when Prensky came up with the term digital native and digital immigrant, the vast majority of adolescents weren't even on the immigrant in internet at that time. In 2002, less than 25% of all adolescents were using the internet on an ongoing basis. By 2004, 95% were. And youth ministry flipped on its head overnight, but most youth pastors didn't understand what was going on. Right? And they suddenly became referees between parents and kids, and they didn't understand why kids were watching these things, and there's these YouTube videos, and what was that? And we were learning how to use all this stuff. Most of the research from the 2000s is very half-baked <laughs> and really just descriptive. Here's what this is. Here's what it looks like. Most people were fighting about the right to frame what is actually happening versus tell us what is going on in digital spaces. And so most of the research from those early years, eras or years are not very helpful in the long run. Which leads us to the second thing that kind of gets in the way is marginalization. We tend to treat adolescents as if they were this one big group of people. And you look at articles about teens in digital spaces, right? You know, uh, that's what the kids are doing today. It's this big group of people. But in reality, it's very different how adolescents use spaces, digital spaces. Early, early adolescents are very concrete minded. And so you got these concrete minds bouncing around in the bounce houses of digital spaces and not understanding how to think critically about what someone else might be experiencing unless it's right in front of them. Early adolescent girls are the most intuitive human beings on the planet. They are constantly got their little feelers out. Do you like me? Do you like me? Do you like me? Do you like me? Well, that is amazingly difficult in digital spaces to always be going, does this person like me? Does this person like me? Does this person like me? We've been talking about that in youth ministry circles for years, the intuitiveness of the early adolescent you know, female. Uh, but Pew Research picked this up and said that there is no other age group. They studied early adolescent boys, early adolescent girls, mid-adolescent, which is high schoolers, boys, mid-adolescent girls, there was no other age group but the early adolescent girls that knew whether people were being primarily nice or mean online. How people treated each other mattered to an early adolescent, and they were paying attention to it. Early adolescent boys, on the other hand, they're just kind of like going on, going on. You know, like, oh, yeah, it's, it's fun. Everyone's having a good time. We're playing games, right? And it's just, they're just bouncing around. But if they're being mean, one of the reasons why people are being mean, they said, well, that person was mean first. But. To a concrete-minded early adolescent, if your green icon is on, to them that means you're there. So if they send you as your youth leader to say, hey, how you doing? But you're actually helping your spouse make dinner or you're working with your kids on homework or you're doing responsible adult things, that 12-year-old cannot comprehend that. That concrete mind is you're ignoring them. The number one reason for cyberbullying is because that person was mean to fir me first. And the most common way that person was mean to me, I was ignored online. Early adolescents are very intuitive and really paying attention. If we're working with kids in digital spaces, 
we also have to make sure that we're actually present with them in digital spaces. And if we're not, if we're multitasking, so to speak, we're doing different things that we log ourselves out so that we don't accidentally create a relational crisis for our adolescents before, uh, without intending to do so. So that's the second thing is marginalization. We tend to treat them as all as a group, but we've got to start thinking of them individually. Mid-adolescence is a little bit different. They're trying on their identities. They're trying on experiments. They want to see what their friends, they, they learn what to do in digital spaces because of what their friends post online. So they're copying. So they're giving you much more a glimpse into their soul and their heart in mid-adolescence. But by the time you get to college age kids, college age students, they're trying out voices. They're sharing what it means social justice. They're sharing what it means to be anti-racial, to get involved. And the way we affirm them and come alongside them will shape our relationships with them. And that's the third area is relational. Our digital relationships with our students mirror our offline relationship with our students. Now we live in a world where we're having a hard time getting together. We talked about, oh, we need spaces, we need full-time youth pastors. But what does a full-time youth pastor and youth room mean when no one's allowed to meet there, right? The relationships we have with our adolescents will depend a lot on the relationships we had with them prior to COVID-19, unfortunately. So as we come alongside and we build time with our kids, we have to be intentional to spend time with our students online too. Continue to cultivate those relationships. As we connect with them, we'll get more and more an opportunity to be with those students. So often though, we, we ask our students to put their relationships at risk. Hey, invite your kids. We're gonna do, invite your friends. We're gonna go do a giant online, massive online game together. Invite all your friends. And we ask them to put their friends at risk, but we first need to have a good, strong relationship with them so that they know if they wanna bring their friends around, they know what's gonna happen, right? With their friends. So we gotta be careful that we don't approach the internet from our own perspective, our own agendas. We need to listen and be present and be aware and watch all of the little things that are going on in digital spaces. The end of uh, John chapter 21 and Jesus has died, he's resurrected the fish. The, the disciples don't know what to do. Let's go back and go fishing. And they're struggling, right? They can't catch a thing. Hey, nothing's working. And this guy comes up on the beach. We know it's Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus though, right? And uh, this guy on the beach has the gall to say to fishermen, try the other side of the boat. Can you imagine what that'd be like as a fisherman? You're like, I know how to do this. I'm the fisherman. That's what it was, right. The fish, are, the fish are boat sensitive. They care about what side. But they do it. And they pull in so much fish, it's capsizing the boat. And Peter realizes this. Like, this is Jesus. And he gets out of the way. He flies up the beach. And, it, and Jesus has a breakfast going for them already. He's already got the fish. And they come in. They're sharing. They're having a conversation. And Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know all things. You know I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. And he does this three times. And, and there's a lot of scholars who tell us, well, the three times relates to the fact that Peter denied him three times. And that, that's probably true. I, I don't know all the details about that. I don't even know Jesus' motivation. In fact, this was written by John Mark, who kind of liked to poke fun at Peter too, right? Peter didn't get it all the time, right? But there's something that interesting happens that John Mark, when he writes it in Greek, he says, and this are things you learn at seminary <laughs> in Greek. He's, Jesus asks me, do you love me? He says, he uses the word agape. It's kind of this, it's this godly love. It's this overabundant love. It's, this, it's, but Peter replies with philo, like a brother love. Like, you know, do you love me like nothing else? And, and Peter replies, you know, you know all things. You know I love you like you're my brother, right? Peter isn't willing to go where Jesus is at. And the same thing happens the second time. And Jesus says, do you love me? He uses agape. And Peter goes, Philo, you know all things. And the third time, Jesus subtly comes alongside Peter and uses the word for love that Peter uses. So often we ask adolescents to act like they're adults in digital spaces. But sometimes we just need to kind of slide that aside and come alongside our adolescents and say, this is where you're at. I'm here to come with you. And I'm happy to could be a long part of your side. So come alongside kids and adolescents. That mattered before, and that will matter after COVID-19. Thank you so much, Brad. <clears throat> and if we could go ahead and pass to our last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, speaker, uh, Pastor Chelsea Erickson. 
Yeah, so delighted to be with you all today. I'm Chelsea, and I am the pastor of Youth and Families at First Congregational Church in Hamilton, so just a stone's throw from the seminary. Um, I also work as a youth ministry editor with an organization called Rooted um, that maybe you've heard of, um, just trying to bring gospel centrality to youth ministers and parents and ultimately to teenagers. Um, so I'm really passionate about this topic today. I work in a, a suburban context. And, you know, I think one of the things that we have to contend with, particularly in the suburban context, is kind of this old school picture of what youth ministry looks like. And it was usually a white guy with crazy hair um, and lots of crazy energy and charisma um, who was there primarily to, to befriend kids, but also kind of to entertain them, to separate them out from the life of the church um, and to sort of elicit good behavior, you know, don't drink smoke, have sex, um, all of that kind of um, language about moralism and behavior modification. I think some of us, that's kind of still the picture that we have of youth ministry and of what a youth minister does. And so I really think we need to contend with that in the suburban church in particular. Um, and I think what we need, uh, I think what, what suburban youth ministry needs, both before COVID and, and in this post-COVID or current COVID context that we're in, is a new level of seriousness, really, about what youth ministry is. And first of all, I think we need to be serious. We need youth ministers who are serious about the gospel of grace, um, who are eager to tell kids more than we want to entertain them, more than we want to keep them out of trouble. We genuinely want to give them the good news of the gospel, that um, Jesus came and lived the life that they failed to live, that he died in their place, and that he rose again to secure new life forever for them with the Father. Um, and this is the really good news that we have the high calling of, of sharing with students day in and day out, whether we're in online spaces or together in person again. Um, I think that really is at the heart of youth ministry and what youth ministry ought to be striving for. And so that's something I'm really passionate about. Um, and, you know, I think it, we've, we've raised already a lot of big topics and big questions that students are asking um, in this time that we're in, in particular. And the gospel has something to say to all of that. You know, we think about Ephesians 2, but Jesus has, has uh, thrown down, has torn down the dividing wall of hostility, right, between, um, between Jew and Gentile. And I think that extends to the divisions that we see in our world today. Um, also, you know, the good news that the world as it is today is not always going to be this way, that God um, has a kingdom project underway that his people are called to be a part of, and that that means the world is going to one day be the, the good and beautiful place that he intended from the beginning. And so the gospel really gives that message of hope that I think kids are longing for these days. They are dying for um, answers to these deep questions. They are dying for um, someone to take seriously their questions and then enter in with some hope. It doesn't mean that we give them all the answers, but I think when we have the gospel at the ready and when, when that's our mission to share that with them in every part of their lives, uh, whether we're in suburban, urban, rural, digital context, um, there's something unique that we have to offer um, that I think students notice and appreciate and are longing for. Um, you know, you just think about how they're asking such big questions right now about the future of the world. And I've, I've been kind of intrigued in recent years by the way so many of my students are really into dystopian novels, um, the way they are so obsessed with the Avengers, as many of us are as adults. And, you know, I think right now they feel that they're living in that dystopia, a dystopia of their own. And the gospel has something to say to that. So I think we need to be, we need to move away from the mindset of babysitting, as others have mentioned, of simply entertaining kids, um, and into more of a seriousness about the gospel that we have to offer that is so beautiful and we know will change their lives if, if God gives them the faith to believe in his son. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is I think that um, maybe suburban youth workers in particular, but I don't know, I think all youth workers, all youth ministers need to be serious about being equipped for the work. Um, if we're going to move away from this model of sort of entertain, youth ministry as entertainment or ba as babysitting, as kind of the, the crazy entertaining guy or even extend that to a woman, like if, if our mission is not just to be entertaining and cool and fun and charismatic, um, then we really need to be serious about being equipped, whether we're part-time, full-time, bivocational, lay leaders. 
there's an equipping that needs to happen for this work because it matters so much. The, the kids, um, the souls of the kids that we care about are at stake and, and we need to have something to say into these spaces. Um, so I think, you know, I think teenagers really do need pastors and even lay leaders um, who are equipped to deal with pastoral counseling issues as well as, as, well as matters of ethics and leadership. Um, and I think they need to be integrated into the lives of our churches in ways that that old model of youth ministry as entertainment just didn't account for. You know, it was kind of, um, I've served in youth ministry about ten, for about 10 years. I've seen different levels of this, right, where churches are really just asking for someone to come and kind of segregate, really, the youth from the rest of the church and kind of occupy them and deal, sort of deal with them rather than calling them into the life of the whole body. Um, and so I think we need youth pastors and lay leaders who are equipped to do that um, who, and who are seen as true church leaders. You know, if there's kind of this juvenilization of the youth minister themselves, then it's going to be a little bit harder for that integration to happen, right? Because people don't see them as a legitimate leader in the congregation. They just see them as kind of, oh, like the fun guy or the fun woman over there who's doing their thing with the students. Um, and then I think also uh, students need pastors who help them think theologically about these different issues we've mentioned. Um, but even more than that, like the theological is one thing, but even more than that, they need pastors who can help them think biblically and who will help them learn to love God's word and study it for themselves. Um, I don't think that our kids need to be spoon fed or entertained. I'm so glad, um, Dean, that you brought up the point about leadership. You know, our kids, especially in a suburban context, there are so many opportunities. My kids are so overprogrammed, right? They can be involved. They can be a three sport athlete on student council, um, you know, helping with key club. They can have so many different opportunities for activities every day of the week. And many of those, especially after they reach about sophomore year in high school, many of those um, include leadership positions where they're really taking ownership as a team captain or um, in an officer role for these different organizations that they're a part of. And so I think if we in the church want them to, to be serious about the gospel, want them to be serious about their roles as um, people made in the image of God and called to serve him in the local church, we need to be offering that kind of leadership to them as well. Um, and I, yeah, I'm so, you know, just thinking about the, the issues that we've been talking about with the spread of COVID, uh, the really just crisis of racial injustice that we're facing, facing in our nation right now. I have been so inspired by, as, as Dean and Dr. Ward have said, just the ownership that my students take in that. My white students are very, very concerned about um, the issue of racial injustice and they are, using their voices and looking for ways to come alongside and, and just listen and learn and advocate um, in ways that I haven't even honestly imagined or thought about. And so I think we need to lean into that and say, yes, you have something to say here. Yes, we need your voices. We're not here just to be, um, I think Sharon Ketchum over at the college um, here in Wenham talks about uh, youth ministry as service providers and how damaging that can be. Um, so we're not here just to be service providers for our students, but we're calling them into leadership. We're inviting their voices to be heard and we're telling them they have a role to play, not just in the church tomorrow. You know, I kind of hate that when kids are like referred to as, oh, the church of the future. No, if they're in Christ, they are the church of today. And so I think they need uh, youth pastors and lay leaders who will take them seriously take the gospel seriously, take the word of God seriously, um, and lean into the high calling that we have to connect those dots. So it's an interesting time because, you know, here we are kind of, I think maybe Dr. Ward and Dean and Brad, you all could speak to this from your experience, but I'm sensing that we're maybe on the cusp of a generational shift that's going to hit us a little sooner than anyone expected, right? Because of some of these changes in our world, the, the crises that we're in at the moment, um, it feels like all of that is just coming a little bit sooner than I had anticipated. I thought I had maybe three or four more years to kind of uh, really dig into um, knowing Gen Z, iGen, and, and helping them in their faith, and that I'd have a little time to kind of watch and learn what the next generation was going to be about. But it sort of seems like those shifts are happening um, 
and, and there's some positive to that. You know, I think our kids are, are wanting to be together. You know, iGen has been kind of notorious for, oh, they spend a lot of time alone at home because they have their devices in front of them. I'm sensing that my students want to be together more now than ever because they've been apart for so long and they've realized um, what an important thing that embodied community is. So there may be some real positives of that shift coming a little sooner, but I think we need to be watching and listening and learning in this strange season that we're in to see, okay, like how is, how are these events shaping culture and preparing to exegete that culture as Dean talked about. Um, and then thinking, how does the gospel speak into that in a really particular way? What does the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, the good news of his coming kingdom where the whole world is going to be remade, not only just individuals, um, what does that have to say to this generation as they are shifting and changing and as maybe the new generation behind them is coming uh, into the fore a little sooner than we thought? So those are just some thoughts from the, um, from the suburban context, maybe a little bit more broadly, but I think we need to be serious about the gospel and serious about what it means to be a youth minister. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Uh, and thank you to our four panelists who have brought uh, a variety of perspectives, speaking of youth ministry uh, from many different contexts. I hope that this was uh, beneficial to you. Uh, so you've had the opportunity here from uh, four powerhouses uh, really in youth ministry. And uh, at this time, we'd like to open it up uh, to those who may have questions here uh, to pose in them. We may have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, so if you could please um, turn on your screen and then kind of just wave at me that you have a question. Um, I see that uh, Marlon Green had a question. Marlon, would you like to uh, go ahead and, and kick us off? Sure, thank you. Um, uh, wonderful uh, presentation, very helpful and very insightful. Um, I actually have a few questions in here, but I'll just go ahead and read one. And if there's time for the others, um, I, can, I can come back in if you... Um, if you call on me. Um, so my first question is, um, how do you propose churches in the urban context with very limited resources take the initial approach to uh, holistic ministry? All right, so we'll take a stab at that one. And then I know Dean may also want to add something to that. So as someone who's grown up in a church in an urban environment that had very limited resources, and then also uh, married my husband, and he pastors a church, and we had limited resources, we started with the resources that we had. So I would encourage you to, if you look at some of the research called Growing Young that came out of Fuller Youth Institute, as quiet as it's kept, young people are still looking for adults, caring adults to come alongside them. Orange Ministry, the growing, uh, the phase project proved that as well. Young people still need caring adults who are ahead of them. So even though Chelsea talked about the generational shift, uh, there's still a need for adults. So I would say go back and reimagine the resources that you have. What we did is we went back, we looked at parents, we looked at older siblings, we looked at the youth themselves and said, how do we equip them? So we established peer leaders. We brought in adults who could, and then we put adults in different sections than from where their kids were. So for instance, if their kid was in elementary age, we put them in middle school or high school so that they didn't have to wear the parent hat and the youth leader hat. Regarding financial resources, I want to just challenge you to reimagine the space. We just found some space in our building, in the attic of our building, totally took all the junk out of it, repainted it, had parents donate. We talked to people and we did friend raising and friends gave and we received resources according to what we could do for our on our on our budget we didn't try to be the the suburban church with a you know twenty thousand dollar youth ministry budget we worked with what we had so i would encourage you to reimagine the resources that you have and then use the kids themselves because kids have a lot of ideas for what can be done and they will give suggestions and you'll go oh and instead of a uh, color you might want to paint it yellow and they'll say no let's paint it green and, and they're like, oh, I have an extra Game Boy, or I have an extra this, and they brought the resources. So I would encourage you, reimagine with what's there, use what's there, because every community has assets. Even the poorest community has assets, has resources. Just reimagine what you have. Hopefully that helps. 
And you can hit me up offline also if you want more information. A couple of other ideas. I'd point to the theological failures of our churches today. A theology that has allowed us to individualize the Christian gospel so that we, if we are nice to Filipinos or migrants or some others, uh, we've done enough. Uh, there's no corporate responsibility to the, to the migrants. And secondly, a theology that's allowed us to divide the church of Jesus Christ into a proliferation of silos. And if one little silo on the corner of, uh, of First Avenue down in your city uh, is trying to look for enough resources, uh, they should think of uh, collaborating with other churches. And a, a group of churches can come up with resources that a single church can't. But as long as we're building our own little silo, we're both limiting the power of the gospel, and we're also limiting our resources to deal with the needs of today. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Marlon, we'll go ahead and see if anyone else has a question, and if not, we'll go ahead and jump into your your, your second uh, your, your other questions as well. So, um, any others uh, questions that you might have, feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Uh, Yes, Allison, I see that you waved your hand. So what I just want to know, where do you see things going for the next year? That's what I was listening for. And I hear the general statements about youth ministry. I've been doing this a long time. You can tell from my white hair. But what are we going to do in the next year? Hi, Allison. Great question. Good to see you. I'm going to let Chelsea or Brad go for it first, and then I'll jump in because I'm talking a lot. Sure. I can share just from our context here what we're, what we're kind of anticipating. I mean, no one's saying this officially yet. So, you know, this is kind of a not exactly off the record because it's a recorded call, but um, it's not, a, not an official statement. But I think we're all anticipating that youth ministry in the traditional in-person ways is going to be very challenging over the next year. Uh, so we have, you know, in our context, we have plans for um, beginning next week, actually, in-person gatherings with students that are socially distanced outside with masks. And we're really looking forward to that, even though, you know, it really limits the kind of fun things that we can do together to build relationships and community. Um, there's something about coming back together in an embodied way that we're just really looking forward to, as I mentioned, I think our kids, our students are really looking forward to it. Um, but we're anticipating here in New England, especially where the weather is not so much on our side in the winter and um, the, even the fall, that you know we may have to go back to digital spaces in the um, in the fall semester and possibly beyond. So, kind of the way our medical um, professionals within our congregation are talking about it right now is just that until there's reliable immunity, whether through you know a vaccine or some other means. Um, we're going to be limited. And so it's hard, you know, it's hard work to rethink. We, our programs are not supposed to be, you know, idolized, right? Our programs are in effect um, because they're a vehicle to, to minister to kids, to build relationships with them. And yet we've, you know, most of us, I think, who are in youth ministry would say we've, we've thought very intentionally about the programs that we have and set up structures that we think are working for us. And if they're not, hopefully we're reevaluating and coming up with something new. So to kind of have to go back to the drawing board and re-envision things when, in a sense, it doesn't feel like it was broken is very, very challenging. And I think there's a lot of fatigue for youth workers right now who are dealing with that having to come up with new ways of doing everything. But I would say, you know, where I am, I think it looks like for the next year, that is going to be kind of our, our normal and our, the role that God's asking us to play. So hope that's helpful. You know, I'll jump on that too a little bit um, and answer at the same time kind of Marlon's question about spiritual formation in digital spaces. Because I think that's one of the questions people have this year is like, if I can't meet with my youth group, in our youth room or at, you know, the Sue and, Sue and Ted's house, where we're going to do youth group and digital spaces 
can we do youth ministry in digital spaces? Is there research behind that? And, and the answer is, well, there's not a lot of research because so much as, as we've heard, you know, here too, right now, I mean, in the past, so much of what has become youth ministry is real moralism, right? We want to, we want to entertain our kids and have them be good. And we're trying to get past that. But if we want to talk about is spiritual formation, can that happen in mediated spaces? Do we have any evidence of that? We certainly do. You know, Christianity is a mediated faith. Christ is the mediator between, you know, God and humans, right? Uh, the Bible is the written <laughs> word of God. This little thing called the Reformation all happened over books and writing. And where you saw books and writing being destroyed and people not allowed to share that in places like France, Christianity didn't flourish, right? And modernism did and grew out of that, where we were not allowed to engage and share thoughts by writing and passing books. Early in North Africa, in early Christianity in North Africa, the sharing of written down letters among people that were, they were separating themselves for spiritual reflection. And they were sharing. We did this. We've been doing this for 2,000 years. Uh, this is nothing new. But what we have that they did not have is the ability for this, right? It was all asynchronous before. When you sent a letter, you had to wait for a response. You had to sit there and reflect on it. Now we can send things out, have kids reflect, and then break them into small groups. Zoom is designed to have an interaction. And so I think part of the strategy for this next year is, is as youth leaders, we've got to be coming alongside our, our adults and teaching them how do you listen to kids in digital spaces? How do you prompt conversation? How do you engage with them here? How do you invite creativity in digital spaces um, and do some fun things together? So I think we're going to see a lot more digital ministry. And I think it will be effective as long as we come alongside our kids in those spaces. So. Thank you so much, Brad and Chelsea. Uh, yes, Dr. Ward. I just wanted to lastly say, and I just sent it to Allison just in case I didn't get a chance to say it. Um, where I just want to say nicely, we all really have no clue what this next year is going to look like, okay? Um, what I can say is this, how we are discipling young people, going back to Dean Borgman's statement that youth ministry needs a new mission and how we engage them. So uh, one of the things I just put in there, increase understanding, increase knowledge with engagement. Now, what that looks like in each context, rural, urban, or suburban, that is to be determined. But I also do believe that this racial tension that we have going on in our country should be forcing, if we look at, if we physically look at who's on this screen here, we all need to be reaching across to say, who do, like, Allison, I want to reconnect with you. It's been a minute since we've chatted. Um, we all need to reconnect across and be intentional about reconnecting or connecting across our ethnic spaces across our geographical spaces and forming new relationships because I think it's a hodgepodge of what everybody has. I don't think there's a silver bullet for this. It's going to have the digital, but that discipleship piece, which we haven't done well with, and that's where we were before COVID, the research was pointing towards trying to figure out how do we disciple young people? And that then COVID hit. And so now I think we're all in the same space of saying, we've got to revisit what that is. The church as a whole is trying to figure that out. And we especially have to figure that out with young people. So I'll stop there because being professors, we can talk forever. So let me just stop. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to follow up on Brad and, and Virginia's statement. Uh, I've got Zoom fatigue with the best of you because I've been on all kinds of webinar Zooms, leading them, following them, and so forth. But I'm also getting a little better at it, and I'm getting to love people uh, on it. And so I wanted to hear from Jen and from Charles Mentos and, uh, and Nathan and Stephen and Charles. Wondering what you're thinking, uh, Shanice. I, I just really want to get into your lives. And uh, you've, I'm, I'm looking at you right now, Charles. Thanks for that look. Yeah. And so I'm getting a little better at Zoom. And I think we need not only Zoom uh, training, but we need group training, uh, the old group movement, active listening, and the ability to ask questions. We need a little more psychological training so that we're interested in people. Jesus', Jesus question were <clears throat> a lot of them, who do you think I am? And who are you? And what do you need? And then to follow up Zoom with a phone call, with an email, 
uh, with a visit at distance. We got to use this stuff and stop talking about it. So I'll stop talking. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, can I say something? Or? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dean and um, Dean Borgman and Dr. Ward. Um, Dr. Ward knows this story a little bit because I came to her when I first came into Gordon Conway, it might have been about a year and a half ago, um, I was just starting off youth ministry and I was like, I don't know what to do, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, Dr. Wood pretty much uh, recommended the, the, the class that she had. Um, and she's like, before that, just make sure you develop that relationship with the youth and, and engagement is very important. So I started to do that. And as I continued to do that and, and had her class and, kind of read your books, uh, Dean Boyman, and, you know, the Foundations of Youth Ministry, The Growing Young. There's so many great books and so many great things I learned in the class. Uh, the youth ministry grew from me having three to five kids to 49 kids. So I was like, wow, this is so much. I'm starting to hear s some female questions I wasn't able to answer. So now I had to start recruiting uh, other uh, members and, the biggest challenge was when I started recruiting a team around me. I was intentional and prayerful about it, but they didn't have a theological background or the education that I was learning. So that's when I kind of like fell back and I humbled myself and would put everything in prayer. But it wasn't until I started um, having Bible study and prayer with them weekly that's when they started to, that dividing and that pulling that tug and started to move away and, and, and ministry started to be a lot more easier. So I like to say uh, developing a relationship with the youth is so important and teaching them to develop a relationship for, uh, to God for their own selves and teaching them how to pray is so important. And, you know, the, giving them examples like, hey, oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for life. You know, the simple things, and you just say, in Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes we just think we make things too complicated. And sometimes the simple things are showing the, the love and, and listen. As adults, we talk too much. Just listen to them. And I think these things is important. And it's been a blessing doing ministry. And it's a challenge to, to get them online, but the, they, I feel like talking to them offline when I call them individually, I get more of a response versus when I do my Zoom meetings, I do twice a month with them on Fridays. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I thank you guys for all the information. And Dr. Wood, of course, I think I praise God for you for all the putting all these things in front of me. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Dean Boyman. Thank you so much, Charles, for sharing that, that amazing testimony uh, of just uh, the work uh, that you've learned uh, in the classroom with Dr. Ward and how that's really manifested itself within the local church. So, and thank you uh, to all the panelists uh, for, for joining us uh, today on the call. Let's give them a round of applause. I know it's a silent round of applause because we're all on mute, but uh, I'm sure they feel it. Uh, we all feel it here on this side. Um, Gordon Conwell is here to be a resource to you uh, within your local ministry context. We want to be there for you. We want to provide you with uh, the resources, the training. We want to build that relationship with uh, everyone here on this call. So if there's anything that we could ever do for you uh, on behalf of the seminary, please do not be shy to reach out to us. Uh, we, are, we are here to serve the local church. Uh, so we'd love to continue that build relationship with you. We're actually going to put it in the chat section, a, a brief link for those who are interested in learning more about uh, Gordon Conwell. We have our information there, as well as a virtual preview day, in a sense, a campus visit online that you can have the opportunity to sign up for if you want to learn more about the seminary in, a, in our different campuses at Hamilton, uh, Boston, Jacksonville, and, and Charlotte. So uh, thank you, everybody. Once again, I hope that this was a blessing to you. I hope you're able to learn from it and grow from it. Uh, if you have any qu other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, and I will go ahead and uh, ask uh, Kristen Chalapali, who works in admissions with us, uh, to close us in a word of prayer. Awesome. Thank you. Heavenly Father, um, we just thank you so much for this time to gather together, Lord, and be able to have conversations um, surrounding our youth. And I just thank you for each person that is represented here today, Lord. 
Um, I pray over their ministry, God, that you would continue to fill them up, Father. Um, refresh them if they're feeling that fatigue, God, and help them to um, lean into you and what you're calling them to do with their ministry, God. I thank you so much um, that you are walking with us in everything we do. And um, Father, I pray that we would just continuously go back to your word and your truth, bringing families in, Lord, um, coming alongside of these youth in order to grow um, more and more into men and women of you, Lord. So I just thank you for each person in each church represented here today. And I ask that you would fill us up as we go, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One last quick plug. Uh, this recording will be posted on our Gordon Conwell admissions page. Uh, and what we will do as well in the, con in the um, comment section is provide some extra resources for you uh, from our different, uh, from our different uh, professors and faculty here of work that they've done in this area uh, that can help equip you as well. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and we will, and we will provide that to you shortly. So thank you once again, everybody, and uh, have a, a great rest of your day.